Welcome to this game theory lesson on sequential games. My name is Matt Rosu, dropping videos all semester as I'm teaching this course on Susquehanna University. You can follow along for free, just like and subscribe. And this video is about solving sequential games. The previous one was setting up what's meant by a sequential game. How do we diagram a sequential game? You may want to check that video out first if you haven't yet. But let's go into solving. How do we solve a sequential game? To solve, generally we use what's called backward induction or sometimes it's called rollback. I like to think of it as what Stephen Covey would say, begin with the end in mind in the seven habits of highly effective people, in that you start at the end of the game and you work your way backwards, solving for every sub game, the individual decisions people have, various points within a tree diagram, you solve game, you know, once you solve, you know what happens at a particular spot in the game and that can be used elsewhere. You repeat until you get to the beginning of the game and you realize what should somebody do at the very beginning. Uh, rollback equilibrium, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. That's what this is called. So where you're finding the sequence of Nash equilibria throughout a particular game what is the overall equilibrium in a sequential game. It's referred to as the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. That is the equilibrium when it's, you know, every single subgame is in equilibrium and the entire game is in equilibrium. I think it might actually make a little bit more sense as we solve. In the previous video, we showed this particular game, right? A parent and a child, simple game. Uh, my lovely handwriting on the screen. Child could behave or not behave. The parent could offer a snack or not offer a snack. Uh, so what are first the subgames? Well, the entire game is kind of considered a subgame, but really the two proper subgames are the two cases where the child makes an action. Because so the child can make an action after the parent offers a snack or after the parent doesn't offer a snack. Each of these are subgames. So what does the child do? Well, if the child is offered a snack, we would see they could behave. The child could get a payoff of one. The child's payoff is listed second. They could not behave, get a payoff of four. Well, four is better than one, so the child would choose not to behave. And what happens if the parent would choose no snack? Well, once again, child could behave or not behave. Payoff for not behaving is zero. The payoff for behaving is negative two. Child will choose not to behave. So in both of these, we know, and the parent would know, for each possible choice of offering a snack or not offering a snack, what the child is going to do. And in this case, it's the same thing. It's not behaving either time. And the parent can then use that information to realize they could get a payoff of negative two or a payoff of one. And you know, thinking through how, how to solve just what would happen here. These are the actions we would expect to take at each subgame. Given what the parent does, we would actually say then the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. The parent does not offer a snack and the child does not behave. That's the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. The payout, one for the parent, zero for the child. The centipede game. So suppose a game exists where player A moves first. If player A stops the game, they get a dollar, B gets zero, game is simply over. If they continue, it rotates who gets the next move. And each time somebody says continue, they actually reduce their amount of money by a dollar, but the other person gets two. So if player A says continue, player B then faces a choice where they could get two dollars, player A would get zero, or they could continue giving up a dollar, but knowing that uh, their opponent gets an extra couple dollars. This game is called the Centipede Game because originally it was drawn out to 100 rounds, 50 choices. Um, you know, it could be like 50 choices by player one, 50 by player two, or A and B. Go ahead and draw out what the game tree might look like. Do not do 100 rounds, but go ahead and draw out one, what one might look like. I'll you should pause to do that. Now that you've unpaused, we will see 
what happens here. And the centipede game looks, looks like this. The next question, what is the Nash equilibrium of the centipede game? Well, this is a weird one because if they continue on for 20, 30, 40 rounds, you start to talk about payoffs in the dozens of dollars. But the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of this game is actually to stop in the first round initially. Question comes up, why is that the case? And let's think about it. In the very end, a player wants to stop because they'll get an extra dollar. Remember, every time a player continues, they take away, they lose a dollar, but the other player gets two. That, that happens every time. So at the very end, the person who has the last decision would rather not lose the dollar. Um, so they're going to say, they'll say stop. That would mean, however, we know what happens in the very last move of the game. And in the second to last move of the game, we, we know the person who makes the second to last move, they're going to get hurt if it goes to the last move. So they would say stop. Well, then we know what happens, though, in the second to last move. So in the third to last move, the player would choose stop and so on. And actually, you know, rolling this backwards using backward induction, we see players want to stop at every single move along the way. And the only subgame perfect Nash equilibrium is actually to stop right away and just secure the 1 0 payoff for player A. There is a good question does this make sense at all? Uh, I think that's a fair question. Some games, backward induction may not make sense. This might be a game where that's the case, where you know if you continue on at all, you both could get a much bigger payout than if you stop right away. Um, so that this one might not make sense, and not all models make sense in all cases, but the centipede game is definitely gives you a weird result. A couple more points with sequential games. A general question, is it advantageous to move first or second? That often depends on the game. So sometimes it is an advantage, sometimes it's a disadvantage. Generally, not always, but in games of complete information, uh, moving first is often the better move. They're the better, you're in more of an advantageous situation moving first because you can commit to your particular course of action and make your opponent make a choice after that. that. That wouldn't always be the case. I mean, imagine rock, paper, scissors if you have to move first. You lose every time. But in a lot of games, moving first can get you a big advantage. If a game is incomplete information, uh, often waiting to see what happens could be more beneficial. A second point a lot of games get too complicated to draw tree diagrams really, really fast. So tic-tac-toe, player one could make, what, nine moves right away? Or maybe you simplify to say it's center, a corner, or a side. That's three. But then player two, what does player two choose? Well, if, if it's center, then it's corner or side. If it's a side... Oh boy, it's a corner next to or a corner opposite or the center or a side opposite or, I mean, like all of a sudden we have so many branches, it can really get too complex for us to diagram. And that's just a limitation we face. There isn't too much we can do about that. I mean, it can be diagrammed. It just takes a super long time and it becomes uh, not very practical. Final point we'll make on sequential games, we use backward induction. It's a powerful tool. It really is amazing what it can do for us, but it's, it's not the tool that's right for all circumstances. Sometimes it's not the centipede game we discussed. That's kind of a weird result. Might not be appropriate there. Uh, so we will be discussing throughout the course, when is backward induction more appropriate? When might it be less appropriate? That's what I have for today's lesson, uh, solving sequential games. We will have more sequential games throughout the course. I, I hope you're enjoying this. Uh, please like, subscribe. If you know others who maybe would like to learn a little bit about game theory, go ahead and share it with them. Look forward to seeing you, though, in the next video.